So memory to us seems like a fairly homogeneous process. So from a point of view of an interface of a designer, it's a wonderful thing because, um, you know, I remember some, you know, I think about something and then something comes back and I don't have to worry about uh, what type of memory I use because a common theme of today's lecture will be that there are many different types of memories. There's iconic memory, there's short-term working memory, and there's long-term memory, and there are very different types of long-term memories. But that's all sort of hidden. This, this, this sort of interface is very, it's totally transparent, and I don't have to worry about that. Of course, we all know from uh, own experiences, from comparing our experience with those of our parents, let's say, or of picture books or newspaper articles, that memory is very selective and is highly edited, fortunately, unfortunately. And we only uh, sort of selectively relive, um, well, edited, highly edited parts of our life. And I, I took this quote because I was really struck by it that to some extent, uh, and there are a few people who have no memory, no memory of this sort, that without memory we're really, we're really, yes, we're conscious, it's going to be a theme of today's lecture, but we're really severely impoverished in terms of who we are, who we think we are, uh, what we, you know, uh, uh, our notion of self and selfhood and personhood, all of that is heavily tied up to, uh, to what we remember. So first of all, I mean, uh, how do you define memory? And this is one definition I took from a book of an of a Israeli neurobiologist. Memory is the retention of experience-dependent internal representations over time. There have to be meaningful representation because otherwise if you just say, well, it's a change in your body or a change in your brain is a function of experience, then sort of, you know, adaptation would be, injury would be, as you grow, or, you know, as you grow, as you change, you know, if, from a child to an adult, all of those would be memory. And the, typically, we don't consider those memory. So the idea is that some internal representation uh, that gets updated as a function of your experience. There's a fundamental distinction one has to make, both in computers as well as in, uh, in uh, human or, in, or in, in biological organisms. The distinction is between activity-dependent de memory and structural memory. So by activity-dependent memory, I mean memory that rely on, uh, on ongoing electrical activity in your brain. So uh, I'll show you a few slides, but if I give you a number 3 or 33 and I ask you, you know, in a minute to tell me the number that I told you, you store that in a short term in a, something called working memory, and uh, the evidence we have seems to show very strongly that you do that by elevating the firing rate of neurons. So neuron, the, the firing rate of neurons is elevated for, you know, however long you keep the thing in, in working memory. And so that's just a bit like, a, like, a, like DRAM, uh, where you, you, you retain, in a computer, you retain your digital memories, but as soon as you, the power goes off, the, the, the memory is gone. This is more like ROM, right, where you have long-term memory, which do not depend on, the, on ongoing electrical activity. So, for example, when I tell you, uh, remember the Statue of Liberty, or, you know, think of Brad Pitt, when, before I asked you that question, there was no explicit firing, there was no neuron that fired explicitly in, remember, in, in sort of to encode the Statue of Liberty or Brad Pitt. When I ask you this question, you recall you, you, you had to access some sort of structural memory, which in turn gave rise to some neural activity, probably, for example, in the case of Brad Pitt or in the case of the, the Statue of Liberty in your visual part of your brain, because it involves image, uh, imagery. We know, for example, from lots of cases where people where their brain activity goes essentially de facto to zero. So, for example, um, circulatory arrest, or will people do this now routinely in some types of major heart operation, when the heart beats and you have to, for example, um, in fact, Francis Crick had this a couple of years ago, when he had a heart operation and when they opened the heart, they realized that they had to replace this aorta, the inner tubing of the aorta was something artificial, because it's very difficult, people do it now, but it's, very diff it's much more difficult to operate on the beating heart, obviously, while it beats. You cool down, you, you stop, you put the patient on a, on a, on a heart-lung machine, and um, in order to prevent damage to the brain, you cool down the brain, or you cool down the entire uh, blood to something like 10 degrees, very chilly, 10 degrees uh, Celsius, I don't know, like 50 degrees Fahrenheit, quite chilly. You do it slowly over a couple of minutes, and um, essentially what you see in the EG, we, I know this because we talked to the anesthesiologist afterwards, the EG goes totally flat on, on, on all channels. So it's a flat, flat EG. So in other words, there's no overt large-scale electrical activity left in the brain. And then you typically have like between 30 and 40, 45 minutes left uh, to do the operation because statistics shows 
uh, of recovery of patients, if you wait any longer, there will be serious um, cognitive deficits in, in, in the patient later on when they wake up. Anyhow, so, you, so in case of uh, Crick, he woke up and he has no trouble with his memory. So it's just an experimental proof. We also know this from you know, people who are knocked out for short times, etc. You might not remember things that went on directly before the accident, like a couple of minutes before, so-called retrograde amnesia, but in general you have no trouble with uh, remembering things over long term. Here, of course, uh, we know a lot about the basis of this, at least in simple animals. Last year's Nobel Prize was given, among others, to Eric Kandel for studying some of the biophysical um, and the molecular changes that underlie that underlies structural memory. So the best uh, today theory says, and there's lots of evidence in favor of them, that part of structural memory, maybe a very large fraction, is encoded in changes in synapses, so the contact points between neurons. They increase and decrease their weight, it's called synaptic plasticity, and you have an increase in synaptic weight, it's called long-term potentiation, or decrease called long-term uh, depression, and this is how memories are stored, by manipulating synaptic weights. This by itself is an old idea. It goes back to Hebb. In fact, it goes even back to Freud, and you can find even precursors before then. Anyhow, so the uh, distinction between activity-dependent memory and structural. Here, if you power the brain down, uh, the memory is gone. Here, it's immune to that, at least for short times. Um, yeah, there are many different forms of long-term memory. So long-term memory is not really precisely defined. Uh, it's probably all of these depend on structural changes in the brain and they go on from minutes to hours to your lifetime. Uh, and you don't need to rehearse, I mean, once you've learned it, it's in, it's in your brain. Of course, it does decay, we all know that, and I don't really think, we certainly don't know at the neuronal level what actually triggers decay. We don't know, in fact, there's so many things we don't know about memory. We don't know what the memory capacity is. We don't know what causes what causes, what, I mean, we know at the psychological level something about interference, etc., but we don't know why, why memories decay. I mean, you could say it's a generic argument, you know, it's like any hardware, you know, it slowly goes down, particularly since it's, it's not digital storage, all or none, but it's analog storage, but we don't really know the specific reasons. And like we don't even know something as, as simple as uh, what's our visual capacity. Remember in Johnny Mnemonic, where he has his implant, he goes to, to you know, 320 gig, well, we don't know what our capacity is. Um, so there are some very simpler forms of memory. Simpler is light adaptation or after effects, as we talked as uh, we talked in class already. So right now, you know, when I'm looking at this bright light, and then suddenly the light goes uh, well the other way. When you adapt, uh, night adapt, let's say you want to do astronomy outside in your backyard, you adapt. You only have a red flashlight. Um, you know, it takes you up to 20 minutes really to dark adapt. So that's sort of a form of memory. Uh, after effects are habituations and, and, and priming. I think I have this. Uh, what do you see here? What did you see? Did anybody see anything? Yeah. Okay. You'll see it? Okay, now. Do you see it now? Okay, if I now show this to you um, a, week ago, a week later, did you see this, uh, this figure before? No. Okay. Um, so if I now show you this, so you know it's a Jesus-like face, you know, a you know, bearded man. I mean, most sort of. Um, the claim is now, if I, see you, if I show you this in a week from now, in a month from now, you'll still be primed in a sense that you'll still respond much faster and see, and see a man's face there, even though you might have forgotten you might have forgotten explicit to remember it. So you might not explicitly remember that you saw this, but you would still be primed. This is called visual priming. So again, something has to change in the brain and it has to be quite specific because, you know, this is priming for one specific type of image. And there are many, and illusion books are full of these. A uh, famous one is the Dalmatian dog, where if you look at it, um, it's sort of, it's a black and white image, you don't see anything. But then after a while, if you really sort of, it comes to you that you're actually looking at a, at a black and white picture of a Dalmatian under a canopy of, it, of um, shadow. There's a shadow place, uh, there's a tree, and there's a, the, um, the light, the sunlight comes through the, uh, comes through the, um, the, um, the, um, and the leaves and strikes the dog. So it's a very difficult texture to segregate. You know, where the, where the shadow due to the leaves and where's the texture of the dog. But you see it, and once you see it, you recognize it much quicker. So this is called visual priming. 
Visual priming for us is probably quite important. It enables you to see things much quicker, like traffic lights and you know anything in your environment, like fonts. And of course, it's so strong that you have expectations that even though it might actually not be the real figure, because you are priming, you expected something, you're even much more likely to see it. So there can be quite powerful effects. Okay, then there is a very famously classical conditioning. So that's a conditioning that, um, that Pavlov talks about, um, that for, for which Pavlov, well, Pavlov got a Nobel Prize, actually. I don't think he got it for conditioning. Um, uh, he worked at this in um, pre-communist, in St. Petersburg, under the Tsar, although he also worked under the communists later. And of course, he did this famous experiment where he took dogs, and the dogs would always, um, um, you know, the dog would tend to, to learn, to associate the a particular person, the coming of a particular person was the fact that this person was going to bring them food. And then they would salivate when, when they just saw the, the person because they, they bound, they associated two objects together. They associated the, the presence of the, of the animal trainer with the, future, with the future reward. They associated that. And so they, they started to drool just when they saw the, um, just when they saw the trainer. So this is called classical associative conditioning. Associative conditioning because you associate two events, the, the CS and the US, the unconditioned stimulus and the conditioned stimulus, and you, what, you, what you get is a conditioned response. So there are many, many forms of, co of conditioning, and they play an important role in our lives, although for the most part an unconscious role. Although um, this is part of now uh, thesis research, some of this, in order to acquire some of this, you might actually need to be conscious. So some of the best studied is uh, fear conditioning and eye blink conditioning. So these are, of course, like usual, these are forms of conditioning that you can easily study in the lab. These are, may not necessarily be the most powerful one that operate in daily life, although fear conditioning sure is, is important if you have it. Um, so in fear conditioning, um, you know, the, the way you do it experimentally in a lab, the way, for example, we do it, you, you shock people, you give them electric, a light electrical shock, and then you associate various tones with it. So there are different forms, there's um, simple conditioning and there is differential conditioning. So typically what you do, um, so this is time, so you give a little, let's see, tone, so this is called the CS plus, the condition, the positive condition stimulus, and then let's see, at the same time here or sometime later, you give a, you give a shock. Okay, and you do this, if the shock is strong enough, you only need to do this once. Now, in a lab, usually you can't do this to humans. The, the committee won't let you do that. So um, you have to do it. Um, uh, so in animals, you can do, for example, in mice, it's typically done, or in rats, it's done. When, when, you, when you shock the animal a couple of times, or you do it in humans, where it takes, you know, three or five or six, depending on the strengths, and then um, you measure the response. So what response you measure in people, you can measure different things, like heart rate, like uh, pupillary diameter. Uh, like uh, skin conductance, changes in skin conductance. So this is, of course, at the basis of, of the lie detector, right? You have the autonomic nervous system. It responds, and one of the ways it responds is by increasing the skin conductance. You start to sweat. That's what you pick up in a, in a lie detector test. Now, of course, it's, it's, um, it's re there's a large amount of variability, as now can tell you, in, uh, in skin conductance. Um, and... Uh, so, which is, of course, a big problem with lie detectors, which is why the scientific community, the psychologists said they do not believe that lie detector is a reliable way to measure. To measure. And it's probably used when you talk to law enforcement or, or um, when you talk to national security guys type people. The main reason I think it's used is, is a low-level deterrence. Uh, clearly, you can train yourself. You know, good, any good actors can do that. You can control, control yourself sort of to, uh, to, to limit and control those emotions. So when you lie, you don't get terribly aroused. And certainly if you're pathological, it's almost impossible to pick. If you're a psychopath, it's impossible to pick it up because you just don't have any of these normal reactions that, you know, if I don't lie and suddenly I lie, I'm under a great deal of stress. I might not reveal it from the outside, but, but I'm, go I'm, go I'm going to get very anxious and start sweating, and that's something you can pick up. So when you do this pairing of the CS with the, um, with the electric shock, you do it a couple of times, then the next time you hear this tone, beep, you automatically start to sweat. To a certain extent, so it's automatic. So, uh, or for example, what we do in mice, we, we, we're doing this research also in mice, we use freezing. So what happens to the mice when they, you, you shock the flow, you do it three times or six times, then every time they hear the tone, they sort of totally freeze. You can see it for many, many seconds. That they're sort of, you can just see very faintly, you can see them breathe, but otherwise they totally remain uh, motionless. Now that's a typical reflex of a very small rodent, right? 
either they flee or they or they, they freeze depending on circumstances. That's not something you know big animal would do, but that's very often what what small um, animals would do for, for obvious reasons, freezing response. So that's another way to measure, or you like say you can measure a heart rate or you can measure pupillary diameter. These are different things you can, uh, you can measure. So now this is simple conditioning. You can do differential uh, conditioning when you, have a, uh, when you have a CS plus and a CS minus. So let's say uh, you can also have, um, you know, other, so let's say this is a high tone, beep, and here you have a low tone. This is called the CS minus, and the CS minus is not associated with any shock. So you randomly get this intermix, you get beep, deed. and every time, you know, when during training, every time I gave you beep, I shocked you, and so the idea is that the, that the, the neural structures that do this conditioning, they're clever, they can distinguish this from this, they know, quote, implicitly, they know that they've, they've learned that this one does not predict shock, but this one does predict shock, and so you start, in the ideal case, you'll start sweating here much more than in response to the, to the CS minus. So the other common paradigm where people have done it, particularly Dick Thompson and others, is uh, eye blink conditioning, which is where you take a little puff, you, take, you put a, um, a puff of air into the eye, you blow it, and of course, particularly if you don't have contacts, it's a quite annoying uh, stimulus and you blink. And this you have to do like 50 or 100 or 150 times, but then you can quite reliably also get association with, typically it's done with, in the auditory domain with various tones, where in response to the tone you'll blink. And so it's interesting, you do this auto automatically, and you, you can observe yourself, uh, you know, there are these tones, and suddenly you, you, you blink. Of course, you can perfectly well also blink reflex-like, but that has a different dynamics, and, and, and you can pick that up. Fear conditioning is probably terribly important for uh, lots of pathologies like uh, trauma, um, post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome. When people, uh, you know, had a, you know, a crime was committed, you know, in battle, you know, at some, some battle scenario, and... Um, uh, where, where people, you know, where people have these flash, uh, flashbacks and, and remember them, and of course, you know, in the ve severe case like post-traumatic stress syndrome, they might not be able to live a normal life because it interferes so much to such a large extent. Then what you can do, you can do extinction. So in extinction, what you do, you take this and you repeat just the CS plus for let's say 10, 20 trials without giving the the, the shock again. So the idea is that you learn a new memory, you overlay a new memory onto the old one. The new memory says, okay, the CS plus isn't associated with, with anything. The old memory says CS plus will, will, will be followed by a shock, and so therefore you tremble or sweat or whatever. But then when you do this extinction, hopefully, if you do this often enough, you'll tend to, uh, you know, you, 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 your, the system that mediates this uh, associative co uh, condition will learn that, oh, it, doesn't, it isn't associated with anything bad anymore. Now, of course, the trouble is very difficult to do this for these patients, you know, when you've been raped or in a, in a war scenario. How, I mean, you cannot really recreate this re to any realistic extent in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a lab or in a hospital. So that's one trouble with, uh, with post-traumatic stress syndrome. Then con context-dependent conditioning. We know that we might, you might know this from, uh, from school or from any t place you learn. It's much easier to recall things when you learn them, when you, when you retrieve them in the same location where you learned them. This is particularly strong for fear conditioning. So, I mean, I can see it in my, in, my, in my animals, but you can also see it in some people. You know, if a bad thing has happened to you in one particular location, let's say in a parking garage, somebody tried to mug you, you know, you'll be, you'll be very anxious. and You won't know why. I mean, this is not, I mean, sometimes it might go, it might go hand in hand with an explicit memory of the, whatever happened there, but very often it's just you feel sort of, you know, you just feel an, uh, antsy and nervous and, and anxious. Uh, and why? Because, well, you have context-dependent for some fear conditioning. You can clearly see this in mice when if you drop them in the same cage where they were shocked compared you take them in, you put them in a new cage, then they will also, in the same cage where they were shocked, although you don't do anything, you just, you know, a day later you put the cage in the same mouse, it, you know, it has this association, I got shocked there, so I might be shocked today, so it immediately freezes. Um, so again, this you can, of course, also try to do uh, extinction by putting people in the same context where, where the bad thing happened to them. Uh, context uh, dependent condition. Yet also help for recall, just learning. So if you know you're going to have to take the test here, in principle, it would make sense to actually learn also here. I, I don't know how important it is for things like abstract learning. I know it's terribly important for for fear conditioning. I can see that with, with my dog, where that something happened in at this one door, sort of a door partly fell onto onto um, one of my dogs, and for the next four years, the dog would never go near the door. You know, it's so just a single event. It can be very, very powerful. And the same is true for us. 
very uh, very strong appetitive conditioning, for example, for um, for bad food, right? I mean, it's very very or it's um, it's very strong. You know, if you you and you might you might remember when when you were young, when you and this can last here. There can be an interval, maybe up to 20 or 30 minutes between when you actually ate and by the time you threw up. And even though there's this long interval, because it's a special purpose system, you remember it, and for the next many many years, you'll tend to avoid that. You'll tend to avoid that place, and you'll tend to avoid that that uh, that food. It's a very powerful aversive aversive uh, aversive conditioning effect. Now there are two forms of them. Okay, so there are many different forms, and they're sub subserved all by different neural structures. Even within, let's say, eye blink or fear conditioning, there are two subforms. One is called delay, and the other one is called trace. So it's a weird nomenclature, but essentially, in delay, there's uh, uh, the, the essentially coterminate. So here's a tone, and here's a puff of air, or the in air eye blink conditioning, or the shock if you do shock. So the important thing is that they, they terminate together, or they all basically overlap. Or trace conditioning, you have this interval between the offset of the tone and the electrical shock. So deep, ksh, versus here they 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 they, and they go together. This, as you might imagine, is a more robust form of conditioning than this, because here sort of you know the, the things go go at the same time. Well, here there's an intervening event, and of course in this intervening interval, in this case it's short as a second, all sorts of other things could have happened. And for example, you could have maybe distracted the animal or the person in this short interval, and then it turns out, in fact, uh, as we and other people have shown now, that you, uh, you, can, interfere with, uh, you can interfere with acquisition of, of conditioning. And you can do it easier in this, in this paradigm than in this paradigm. Now, as I mentioned, for food, this can be very, very long. For food, it's 20 or 30 minutes. But that's because it's a special purpose thing, because obviously when you eat something, usually you don't immediately th uh, throw up. It takes you some time you know, in order to develop nausea, etc. There's a famous paper a couple of years ago by people down here in San Diego, Clark and Squire, I won't go into the details, who essentially said that, and, and this goes back 30 years, these sort of ideas, the thread, that, that uh, trace conditioning, the more complex form of conditioning, requires attention and awareness. Because you have to, you ha you have to put things sort of into short term, into some sort of working memory, because you, you get the, t the, the, the don't eat, and only then, you know, two seconds later or a second later, whatever, do you get the uh, the uh, the air shock, and that is a sort of more sophisticated w version. And they could show using um, um, a questionnaire. So they ask people, so you're watching this movie. It's a silent movie. You're being told it's a memory experiment, which of course it's not really. And uh, you should really pay attention to the movie. And then at the same time, you get these deed and ksh, you get these different noises and tones, and uh, occasionally you get a puff of air. And the claim is that, um, that when you're really engaged by the movie, when you're really looking into the movie, you don't pay attention to, you know, okay, clearly you know, you hear that, you, you hear their tones, you hear their noises, and you feel the puff of air, but you don't really pay attention to what's the temporal order of one or the other. And, and so the claim is that if you don't pay attention, you don't develop trace conditioning. If you're not aware of the relationship, of the so-called contingency relationship, of the relationship between the CS and the US, the tone and the, sh the puff of air, then, you don't, then, you don't, uh, then you're not conditioned. Well, for delay conditioning, when there's no, when here, when they co-terminate, this, um, this form, you, you don't need to be aware. That's their claim. That's exceedingly interesting because that allows us I was really electrified by this because this allows us, in principle, an experimental test that we can try in animals. Because now, we can, we, in principle, we can do this in animals, and we have. So it was, it was uh, together with David uh, Anderson's lab here in, bio, in, in biology and two postdocs, uh, C.J. Hahn and Colin Otutek, we, we've done this now in, in, in mice. And the idea is the following. I mean, first of all, the rationale, why are we doing this? In, in another, in, you know, in, in, in human, in, and why are we also doing it in, in mice? Well, yeah, ultimately, you want to discover the NCC. Now, clearly, doing that in humans, it's not going to be possible because functional imaging is great, but you know it's very crude. So, even in monkeys, you know, you don't, for ethical reasons, for practical reasons, you cannot really interfere at the at the circuitry level where you want. You cannot really take apart the circuitry. Right now, we just don't have the technologies. But we can begin to do that in a genetic um, a model, in particular in mice. Of course, it would be even better if we could do it in flies. And flies do have trace and delay conditioning, but they're so much further removed from us, it's much more difficult to make an analogy, an argument by analogy. But here, if I can say, so here I here have two phenomena, a phenomenon in humans, and in humans, one of these phenomena is associated strongly with awareness, the other one not, and it, they have a certain characteristics. And if I can reproduce the same phenomena in mice, 
Of course, I don't know about awareness, but if I can show similar things in mice as I can in, in humans, then I can make an argument, well, maybe something very similar is going on in humans. And so here what we have, we have the same thing, we have similar to what Squire and, and Clark showed for eyebling conditioning, here we do it for fear conditioning, so we have tones, long tones, and then we have shocks, two second shocks. This is delay, this is, um, this is trace, and then here at these times we, we show them distracting light, so the mouse is in this cage, there are tones here, and then sometimes the electric floor, we give these brief electric shocks to the floor here, and then at this time here I flash lights randomly. This is pretty dark and suddenly, you know, the, you know it's like if, if I suddenly turn the lights in this room on and off. The expectation is that, I would, that it would interfere with, um, it might interfere. And it does very nicely, it interferes with uh, trace conditioning but not with delay conditioning, very specifically. So, so in other words, we can, we can, we can take uh, animals and they, we do, do trace conditioning with them, we do delay conditioning with them using this freezing and it works fine, the animals learn this. But then if I flash, while I learn, I flash uh, sort of the house lights, I dim the house lights repeatedly, the animal uh, is unable to do, uh, or has, mu has a much greater difficulty doing trays, but it doesn't interfere with delay. It also doesn't interfere with context-dependent conditioning. So um, that's potentially very interesting because here you have now maybe a mouse model that you can use to study attention and awareness. And why is it interesting? Well, for example, things like this is uh, Henry Lester here, professor in Austin Biology. So what, what, what they can do now, they can use uh, specific um, silencing genes. They can introduce genes into the animal, either by a viral vector or by uh, transgenic animals, that will specifically, and uh, that will under control of some external factor, knock out, um, that will silence neurons. So normally it fires here, but then you add this magic bullet, I won't talk about the neurons, is silent. You can do this transiently in a time scale of a couple of minutes. You can turn this on or off. So essentially you have these neurons and you, you add some drug to this system, it activates a promoter and it, it does all sorts of things, but functionally what it does, it turns off these neurons for, let's say, you know, 20 minutes or half an hour. And so it's a, it, it allows me to begin to interfere very specifically with the system. Okay, let's close several parentheses and go back to, to memory. So this associative memory is one form of memory, uh, a classical conditioning, and the interesting thing, it, there's some interesting relationship to awareness which might allow you to test these things at the level of animals. Um, now there's uh, also a very important model system, um, very important memory is called procedural memory. Uh, now this is essentially sort of uh, talked about zombie systems, and most of the zombie systems of this ilk so, you know, biking and um, climbing and, you know, uh, learning how to speak and learning how to tie knots and doing all the other things that you do in your life, you know, brushing your teeth, all the other things you do, those are all instances of skills and habits. You need to acquire, the, you, you acquire them by doing them over and over and over again. Then after you do them, you do them effortlessly, you don't have to think about them. Fortunately, these are very resistant to decay. So unlike, you know, even Alzheimer patients, you might still, you know, they might have lost a large fraction of the explicit memory, but they still have, uh, you know, their skill and habits. Now, all of these are instances of implicit, or what psychologists call non-declarative memories. Because you don't have an explicit memory. You might have an explicit memory for when you learned, or where you learned these, uh, you know, if you learned, let's say, a new skill like, you know, snowboarding. You might have an, a memory of, oh yeah, I remember I was, you know, at uh, Lake Tao, that's where I learned it. But if I ask you, you know, tell me the details about how to snowboard, you don't have access to that. It's very, very difficult. You do not have, have access to that. This in comparison with declarative or explicit memory. Now that's of course typically what people mean by memory. When you, you know, when somebody talks about memory, that's what they talk about. Now of course you saw, uh, so I don't have to say a lot about this memento. The, the fact is there are patients, um, the most famous one being HM, even more dramatic one is Clive Waring. So HM was a patient who had temporal lobe epileptic seizures, and in order to help them, what the doctors did, and what they occasionally still do, they take out the part where the, where the fossa originates, which is hippocampus. Now his other hippocampus was already damaged, so then he had bilateral hippocampal damage. And that made him essentially unable to form new memories. And he already had, because of course he was already diseased, he had, had already great trouble with previous memories. But really, I mean, so, so it's not that he could remember everything perfectly up to the moment of operation and nothing afterwards, even before he had pretty bad memory. But certainly afterwards, this is now in 1954, the patient's still alive, uh, he had no explicit memories. 
Because just like in, 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 in Memento with, uh, with Lenny, you, you, know, you walk into the room, you introduce yourself, you talk to the guy, the guy looks perfectly normal and conscious, he talks to you, you, know, you ask him how he feels, he gives meaningful answers, you ask him what he had for breakfast, of course he has no idea, he's guessing, you ask him what time of the day it is, he, you know, he might look outside and say it's noon, you ask him what year it is, he might say you know, it's 1954, um, and then you walk back out and you come back in two minutes later and you, know, you go through the same, uh, uh, the same story again. A very dramatic case, which in a sense is even more disconcerting because this is something that could happen to everyone. Clive Waring was a highly gifted Renaissance, uh, musician, specialist in Renaissance in, uh, in um, not Pacherda, who's the other Renaissance? Italian composer. Anyhow, um, um, anyhow, and also conductor. And then he worked a lot, he, got very, he worked a lot at this period, he worked a lot, didn't go to sleep a lot, was highly stressed, and got sick with a, hepatitis, with, a vi with a viral brain infection, almost died uh, due to that infection. I mean, without modern medicine he would have died, he survived, but large parts of both temporal lobes were destroyed permanently. And there's a movie made about him, quite a famous BBC movie, and it's really pathetic to see this person because he... For example, once he fills his diary, which is filled page after page, where it says, I've finally woken up for the first time. Next page, I've finally woken up. Next page, I've woken up and I'm alive for the first time. And he goes through these things again and again and again. He, he talks to his wife. He has no idea who his wife is. But he, he says, well, I, I guess I must know you because he has a feeling of familiarity with her, with her and he has, of course, procedural memory for her and how she, you know, how she moves, etc. So... She, uh, he has some vague feeling that he knows her, but he doesn't really know who she is. He doesn't, in this case, it's really, it, this is the most dramatic case, he has almost no memory of himself. While a lot of these patients, for example, uh, Oliver Sacks has a, a description of the guy, um, uh, who was it, the hippie, the eternal hippie or something like that it was called, because this, this person um, remembered everything up, uh, up till the early 70s, and he was a Grateful Dead fan, and that's what he knew and what's what he talked about. He was uh, a hippie at the time, but now, of course, 25 years later, he still lives in the past. Clive Waring has no past. He's truly a person like a Greek actor. He has no past whatsoever. He's all present. There's nothing but present in him. He has procedural learning. So this was the uh, part of why HM is the most famous patient in sort of neuroscience is um, a, here you had a specific, you know, you take out part of the brain, you have the specific loss, this inability to form long-term memories. Also, you could show in this patient that he had, he could still learn, for example, mirror of writing or Tower of Hanoi or other games. So he, you know, mirror of writing, which is, you know, quite tricky to do. So he could learn that, yet he had no recollection of learning that. So again, this is a case of a patient where you have a dissociation. Yes, he learns, he can still learn skills because that's done somewhere else, but he doesn't consciously remember doing, them, doing those skills. Now the point for us is, none of these patients, including this fictitious patient Lenny here, are clearly are unconscious. Clearly, you can talk to them, they have feelings, they have sensation, no question about it. So, in fact, you don't need any of this. I mean, you need some of this to be a human, to live in the world and to do anything, but you don't need, you probably don't need any of this to be conscious. Now then there is a short-term memory, which is again sort of a bevy of different processes. Again, short-term memory means anything on the order, let's say, a minute or less. Uh, so there's, uh, there's now this theoretical construct by, by cognitive psychologist Alan Badley, particularly at Oxford, called working memory. And it has sort of substructure. There's a central executive, and then there are, there's a visual buffer called a visual uh, scratch pad or buffer. And then in the same thing in the auditory um, domain, it's called the phonological loop. Um, this can be measured in the semantic domain by the digit span. So I wanted to try this to see how your digit span is. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to read uh, l uh, slowly with a heavy accent, a germ, germ accented voice. I'm going to read you numbers. Okay, they're just numbers between 0 and 9. And, um, and uh, let me see, how do we do this? Yeah, I'm just going to read them once, and you should try to remember them. Don't write them down. That's cheating, right? That's using external memory. Um, and, I mean, you don't have to tell me what your digit span is. Um, and then just, um, I'm going to read them once, and then I'm reading them again, you should, and just see how many digits you remember. Okay? So it's uh, 0, 4, 3, 9, 7, 5, 2, 4, 7, 9, 8, 3. Okay? So it's 0, 
four three nine seven five two four seven nine eight three. So now can you, um, uh, no, let's see, no, wait, shit, it's not going to work. Oh, no, I thought I'm being stupid here. We have to do it differently. We have to write them down. Sorry, it's, okay, let me do this again. So I think what I have to, I have to do, um, then I say go and then you write them down, okay? I mean, not these, I'll, let's try with some new numbers. Okay, do you all have paper and a pen? Okay, so it's... But, but only write them down at the end, right? Otherwise... <laughs> <laughs> One, five, seven, four, three, two, five, zero, five, seven, nine, four. Go. Okay, so should I read them out? Yeah. One, five, seven, four, three, two, five, zero, five, seven, nine, four. Does anybody got, no, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. So, it's, uh, so it's, has anybody gotten like ten or uh, seven? Yeah, because otherwise you just write down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It should be in order. Anyhow, I mean, it's, it's just a toy example. So the, this, you might all have heard the magic number 7 plus minus 2. So it's a very famous paper, partly it's famous for its, as much for its, uh, for, its, um, for its rhetorical device using 7 plus minus 2, the magic number, as it is for the actual data. But the claim is that essentially you remember 7 plus minus 2 objects. So the plus minus depends on, you know, your alertness, uh, you know, how interesting, the, you know, the, the material is for you, how well you're rested, you know, all sorts of others, particularly your attention, and your alertness on all sorts of other factors. Uh, and this working memory is, um, and, and so this measures a digit span of working memory. Uh, here's the actual distribution from one paper. So um, this, I think, uh, here they waited for a couple seconds, and this is here they were immediately asked to recall. So you can see this is percent correct. So correct means, of course, the correct digit at the correct location. Um, there's there's uh, there's several uh, special effects. So the the last number, of course, you will tend to remember, or the last two remember the recency effect. You'll tend to remember much better than, of course, things in the middle, and you very often also will tend to remember the first number better than you remember the the um, the, the the other numbers. Um, yeah, so the cl um, so claim even amnesiacs, so amnesiacs are people like HM, you know, people who have am amnesia, but usually this amnesia doesn't extend to, to shorter numbers. So here, clearly, they can certainly remember, you know, three or four numbers or five numbers, then they get pretty bad. Uh, working memory is, uh, relates very strongly to IQ as measured by IQ tests, for whatever that's worth. So uh, uh, it's a very strong correlation, your digit span how many things you can store online is a very strong correlate of your of your IQ. And the claim is you need you need your IQ you need working memory for doing all the tasks that you do constantly, like you know when you navigate from here to somewhere else, or when you you know add two numbers in your head, when you compare, when you draw, you know when you, for example, some of you you know take notes, so you look at here and then you write things down in your notebook. Clearly, you need working memory. So for all those things, you know when. You know, when, when somebody, you know, when somebody te uh, talks to you, you try to make sense of what they say. In German, for example, there's almost can be 200 words between the beginning of a sentence and the actual verb that make that gives the entire sentence meaning. So of course you have to store all of that somewhere, and then the word comes, and you know you can finally process the sentence. So for all those sorts of things, you need um, and you need working memory. Anytime you read anything sort of moderately, you know, moderately complex, you need to remember what what just went on. You know, to understand a movie, you need to remember what went on a minute or two or three. Ago. So for all those things, you need working memory. So it's really at the heart of of um, of, um, of our ability to act in the world. Um, it's chunk. And so uh, so people talk about chunks here. What they mean by that, for example, the sequence I gave you, there was a chunk four three two, 
And of course, 432, you can, you know, and if it's even longer, 4321, that's much easier to remember than four random digits. When, you know, when I gave you a social security, you know, when I gave a number that's your social security, your birthday on, you know, 911, the, the, those are all special symbols. They've been encoded for other things. And so, of course, you can make use of those. And so you can use them to encode. So, for example, this doesn't only extend to verbal memory. It extends, for example, to chess figures. When I show you, when you're a chess player and I show you random figures, you know, I put, um, um, We've done this experiment. When I show you a chess position, I show you two chess positions. A, I take a chess board and randomly put pieces on the board, ask you to remember those. Then you're bad, and you're as bad as an expert chess player, or as good as an expert chess player. And the capacity will be similar to this. Or I, 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 put the, I take the, figures, the, the chess figures from a particular game. So it's, it's, these are all le this, it's a legal configuration, what you see. Then you will be, again, will be pretty, ba you know, will have whatever limit it is. The chess player, trained chess players can do much better because now they see these as chunks. They say, oh yeah, this is a Fiorentetto, this is a, this is a Queen's Gambit. You know, so he remember the configuration because, you know, he has sort of memorized these chunks and so he remembers not the individual elementary, you know, king on R2, but he remembers, you know, a configuration of four figures. So that's called chunking. Now there are some patients who have severely impaired uh, span. These are not amnesiac, these are other people. Very often they also, also have language difficulties. Um, they are severely impaired, so they might only remember one thing or maybe two things. Yet they are clearly still conscious, so they, might, they have difficulty drawing and they will have difficulty reading and comprehending and all of that. So very often they have language problems, which is, makes them difficult to investigate. But you know, as far as you can tell, they, they seem fine, they hear fine, they sense fine. They cannot do some psychophysical experiment, so they cannot do a two alternative first choice when you have to compare this parasite with something that happened 10 seconds ago. That they can't do, but they seem to have all the uh, sensations that a normal person has. Um, and also, if you, if, you re if you just cast your mind back a couple of minutes ago when I asked you to remember those numbers, I don't think, certainly when I introspect, I certainly don't recall all those numbers in my working memory at the same time. I mean, see more like there's a scanning process that I can consciously remember the last two digits or the whatever digits I go through, but I don't sort of have a clear, vivid picture of all seven of them or eight or six uh, in, in my mind. So um, you probably don't need this for consciousness, but it's difficult to say because in the limit, if you don't have working memory, it's very difficult to talk to people. Because if I ask you, okay, what did you just see? Well, you know, if you don't have working memory, you might have had a perfectly perception of blue, but if you, you know, don't have a working memory, you might not be able to answer me that question. So it becomes difficult to test this in the limit of really having no working memory, at least using current sort of current technologies. And certainly there's a very close relationship. So working memory might not be strictly necessary, but for sure there is a very close relationship between working memory and, and consciousness because working memory is such an integral part of our of our day-to-day -day life. What do we know about uh, its neural correlate? Well, people have done a lot of experiments, let's say, in the visual domain. They record uh, uh, memory cells, I'll show you one, uh, down here, as you would expect, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the ventral pathway, the an um, an um, anterior part of the infratemporal cortex, where you have neurons that respond to high-level things like faces and other animals and you know high-level figures, and then also in the lateral prefrontal cortex. Now here you might remember, so you have these two streams, remember the dorsal stream, vision for action, the ventral stream, vision for perception, they sort of reconverge at the level of this area. Indeed, here you find neurons that seem to encode the memory both for where, location, as well as for what, object. So FUSTA has done a lot of work here in this domain. So this, for example, he records in this part of prefrontal cortex. And this, for example, is a typical, there's a whole bevy, a whole zoo of different working memory neurons. This is one. Here, where the animal gets a cue during this time, then the neuron basically is suppressed. And then this is the same neuron doing five different trials. The, the, here, the monkey had to remember something for 35 seconds. It's called a delay trial. So you, um, let's say, you, um, the two Im you uh, flash up an image. No, you flash up two, the two images next to each other, and one uh, image is highlighted briefly, but then both images remain, uh, remain there. And only you know, 35 late, seconds later can you actually um, push a button, for example, push on the, on the location of that one object. So you have to keep it in your mind. And you have these neurons that respond with a you know, high firing rate, 
for as long as the animal is required to hold this memory. And then as soon as the memory sort of, the, as soon as the monkey can then, you know, reach out and push the button when he doesn't have to remember anymore, the, the firing of the neuron goes to zero. The other experiments people now do more sophisticated. This is uh, Earl Miller at MIT. This is called um, delay match to sample. You fix it, you get a drawing of a, of a bell. Now remember, these drawings, you, know, you should remember, are me probably meaningless to the monkey. Because the monkey, you know, doesn't know what a bell is, has never touched a bell, probably never seen one in his cage. So these are just arbitrary line wiggle, you know, wiggles on a, on a line for the monkey. Uh, so he sees a bell, fixates, then sees now two choices, a bell and a, a letterbox, and now has to remember, so here the monkey has to remember, well, during this period here, the monkey has to remember what it was, namely bell. Then here you use that information to access information, to access spatial information. So here, the monkey now has to remember this location. So during this delay, the monkey has to have a wear memory. And then finally, he has to make an eye movement, right? So here, he ha during this period, he has to store a particular type of object. In this period, he has to store a particular type of location. And then there are cells that respond to both, um, that respond to both um, the location as well. It was an elevated firing rate. So here's the first stimulus, here's the second stimulus. And here, for example, if the monkey will the cell will respond to one object, it's a good object, let's say it could be the bell in this case, and will not respond to the poor object, let's say the, the, in the letterbox. So this is what I meant by active memory. You can see here the fine grades go, let's say, from 30 hertz to, you know, 70 hertz or something, they almost double. And probably, and people have made nice computational models, this probably involves a, a working memory, a sort of reverberatory circuit, a local feedback circuit. It's like a latch up that sort of, uh, you know, once you trigger it, it keeps on firing until it's actively reset by the fact the monkey, okay, now I can forget about it because I, I, I can make my eye movement. And when we know from working memory, uh, you know, you can rehearse, for as long as you rehearse it, you can keep things in working memory, as long as you're not interrupted. Remember that one critical location in the movie when he's frantically looking for a pencil to write down that, um, you know, his girl, the girlfriend there is, is um, that she herself did this. Uh, and then, you know, he's interrupted and then he forgets about it. So same thing here. Um, you can, uh, the monkey can remember this for long, long times and the cell will fire it as long as the monkey keeps on, re keeps on rehearsing. Last memory component. Uh, this is called um, iconic memory. And this is probably the one that's most critical for, for, and for memory. So iconic memory is... Um, well, let me demo it to you. Now, how many letters of that did you see? We can do that again. So just fixate at the cross, and then how many letters do you think you can recall? Okay. Which four? I don't think I can I can freeze. It. Well, I guess I can freeze by going out of here. Okay, so those are the. So this is a typical recall experiment, and people have did this first. Ebbinghausen, I think, in the 19th century. You know, you flash up things like this, and then I ask you to remember. And typically, what you get is exactly what you said. It's like three to four letters. And this, of course, depends on all sorts of factors relating to attention. So usually, you know, I would imagine you get those corner letters better than the ones in between, and some letter like X might be more might be more salient than another letter like I don't know W. And some letters, of course, more easy to confuse, you know, with each other, etc. So you can do all this sort of research. But the fact is, you only get a small number. Um, now, however, George Sperling then is a famous psychologist, and he did this uh, for his this experiment I'll be telling you now about for his. PhD research at Bell Lab in Harvard, he was struck by the fact that, yes, I can only get, I mean, apparently I can only recall three or four, but I can sure see many more. I have a feeling that I can see them all. I can clearly see them all, right? And you should all, I mean, you probably all have that feeling. Uh, I mean, I certainly have that feeling that I can see all letters, right? But I only remember three or four. And then he used what is, what's called a partial recall technique. So I'll demonstrate that to you. Now I'll show you the same display, but now there's going to be an arrow. The arrow is either going to be against the upper row the middle row or the bottom row. And depending where it is, I would, I'd, I'd like you to recall just those letters. Okay? 
Okay, now. Okay. SXWZ. So if you now do this, then uh, he did it actually with tones. He did dee, 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 depending, you know, high pitch, medium pitch, low pitch. And this is called partial um, recall. And now what happens, people in this condition can recall like three letters or 3.2 letters, um, which tells you, come back to that a second, what does it tell you? Well, it tells you that, since I didn't tell you ahead of time which of those uh, rows I, um, I'm going to, which of those rows I'm going to cue you on, and you can, on average, if I do this for different rows, on average you can get something like 3.2 letters that tells you that you had to have at least 3 times 3, 9.6 letters accessible, at least for a short time, but then that very quickly decays. And he studied the time cost of this decay, of this decay by giving this cue, you know, the tone of the arrow at, at different times. So either I give it immediately when the uh, image is on, uh, off, or I wait 100 milliseconds, you know, the image on, disappears, then I wait 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds, etc. And what he could show, a very rapid decay curve, that once I wait more than half a second or 700 milliseconds, then you're essentially back to the original performance, um, um, but if I do it earlier, you have, access to mo you have access to most of the content of that row. So the implication is there's a very fast memory, an image memory in this case, but the same thing is true for auditory domain. There's a very fast image memory that you have access to, but it decays very quickly. Let's say within a, within a second or so, it's, it's essentially decayed. And this, this image memory, if you quickly read things off there, you can, you can read off the different aspects but um, so the, the, the fact that you can only have limited access to them tells it's because it decays so rapidly. It's there, everything is there, but you only have access to a very limited part because by the time you read it off, all the other components have, have decayed. So if you read off the middle row, by the time you're done, the upper and the lower row has, uh, has sort of ha, um, has disappeared. Um, yeah, now people study iconic memory, they manipulate the images and they show you images or they show you letters and they do all sorts of experiments. So iconic memory has different components. It has a pre-iconic pre component, so iconic icon means a pre-categorical component in the sense that some aspect of it you don't store as abstract letters like, like the letter A or in the face of Albert Einstein, but you just store it as sort of, as it were, bit patterns almost. And then some pass, aspects of it are post-categorical that you know, you know, that you process it to a high abstract categorical level where you say, well, it's a letter A or it's, you know, the face of Albert Einstein. The way I think about it, these components are probably neuronal afterglow supplemented by some active rehearsing, re, uh, by some active firing. In other words, we know that if you just show a brief input, a brief stimulus to the retina, that you, we have this wave that goes through the system, and even if it's just 10 milliseconds uh, input, it activates neurons, and the neurons will fire, let's say, at least for 100 milliseconds. And of course, the retinal neuron will fire for that long, and it goes into V1. Those neurons will fire for 50, 60, 80, 100 milliseconds, etc. And then it's probably amplified, that, that afterglow, that neural afterglow is probably amplified by local circuits that keeps this up maybe for half a second and a second. Um, and it's difficult to imagine, now A, there's no patient who doesn't have this sort of iconic memory, and it's difficult to imagine what life would be without this very, very brief form of, of, um, of, um, of visual memory. Uh, this, part, this is also the one that, for example, if I blink, you know, as we all do, we constantly blink, that um, I, I can use to, because when, you know, un, until I just point this out to you, you're, of course, perfectly oblivious of the fact that you blinked, I mean, you know it abstractly, but uh, so there you, the image goes, goes, um, goes dark for 80 milliseconds, the time it takes for the, your eyelid to transition over the, over the eye, yet uh, it's not that you have, um, that you don't, for 80 milliseconds there's just blank. So um, that sort of interpolation process probably, re um, probably re um, relies on iconic memory. This is the one that I think to me is the one closest to consciousness. This I cannot imagine how you can do without. Working memory I might imagine you might be able to do without it, although you would be severely impacted, but this one I don't see how you can, how you can do without. And it's correlated probably there is, there's very little research going on in iconic memory. Most of the works on working memory, because working memory you can see clear neurons that do and that don't fire in, in the absence of a stimulus. So if you do this experiment in V1, some of those visual experiments I just showed you, 
you know, the monkey has to remember uh, the location of something or the, opt the identity of something. V1, the, the image goes off, how many seconds later the cells are, fi are, are stop firing, there's no question about it. While those high-level neurons in IT or in prefrontal part of the brain, some of them, they will fire as long as the monkey has to remember that. Here there's no, there doesn't seem to be any simple type of neuron that's involved in, in any one neuron in iconic memory. And I suspect it's something um, that goes on in different stages in the neural pathway. And we know from psychologists that the different aspects of, of iconic memory, and they probably map onto these different stages. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, these are the three different types of memory, long-term memory, working, I mean, long-term memories, this entire set of them, working memories and iconic memories. So next week we'll finish, we'll talk about some split brain patients, that's rather interesting, experimental interference with consciousness. We'll talk about some high-level ideas about um, are you actually conscious of, the, of your sort of the highest level of information processing machinery in your head. Or does consciousness only access some intermediate level theories? We all think explicitly that, of course, consciousness is sort of the most elaborate part of information processing machinery in our head, but that's probably not true. There's quite a bit of evidence against that. And then sort of we'll summarize and um, just sort of review where we have been and where we have gone. Okay, any questions? <clears throat>